Welcome. We are so thankful that you have joined with us to watch this message. We pray it will be a blessing to you, that we'll all learn from it, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in watching the message at this time. Secretariat was a racehorse, considered the greatest racehorse in history. Secretariat was a thoroughbred racehorse that in 1973 won the Triple Crown. Secretariat not only won the Kentucky Derby, but he set a track record. He not only won the Belmont Stakes, but he set a track record. And those two records have never been beaten since. And he set a Preakness racetrack record also, which has been beaten since then. But not bad for a racehorse that ran almost 48 years ago that still holds two track records. Secretariat died in 1989 at the age of 19. When the veterinarian did the autopsy on Secretariat and came to Secretariat's heart, he was astonished. He and everyone in the room watching were speechless over what they saw. Now understand, a regular horse's heart is around eight pounds. A thoroughbred race heart, racehorse heart is around 14 pounds. That would be a large racehorse. An extra large racehorse's heart would be around 18 pounds. Secretariat's heart was 22 pounds. Now we might say that the heart of a racehorse is its engine, the main organ that enables the horse to win races and run fast. So we might say that Secretariat's heart was supercharged. It's no wonder that Secretariat is considered the greatest racehorse in all of history because of his huge heart and his accomplishments. This morning we come to the second of our messages in our mini-series of the Way of the Cross. And today, since it's Palm Sunday, we're going to look at the cost of worship. And we're going to discover the value of our hearts in the cost of worship. Does worship cost us anything? And if it does, what is that cost and how might we benefit by giving up that cost? And since this is Palm Sunday, it only makes sense that we would start by reading the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now, I'll tell you, we're going to branch out from there also. We're going to start here with his triumphant entry, but then we're going to look at another incident in the Bible, and we're going to start comparing the hearts of the people and, and view how their worship led them to conclude different things. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. As they, that is, Jesus and his disciples, approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is one of the more picturesque 
scenes of Jesus in the Bible. And we've seen many paintings and uh, pictures of this as Jesus is riding on the back of a donkey, going down the road into Jerusalem as the, the throngs of people crowded on both sides and laid their palm branches and, and their cloaks out for him. It was the entry of a king. And this is how they were welcoming, welcoming him into Jerusalem. The question for us, though, is that why is it that the crowds only a few days later yelled out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Why did they cheer him on that road that day, but yet turn on him a few days later? Wasn't Jesus the king of the Jews? Yes, he was. Didn't the people revere him as king? Yes, well, kind of. So why did they turn on Jesus? We go back to verse 11 of Matthew and, and we see that question answered for us. See, people came to Jerusalem for the Passover feast from all over the known world. So Jews that had moved out of the region came back also and many of them had never heard of Jesus in his ministry. And so when they saw this happening, they asked, Who is this? Matthew 21, verse 11. The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Notice the people's answer. They did not say, This is Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and Savior. They said, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And here's the problem. They saw him as a prophet. And if you go down through the ages of Old Testament Israel, they were known for crucifying, or, or I shouldn't say crucifying, but, but persecuting the prophets. They didn't want to listen to them. And here we have Jesus as their king, entering into Jerusalem. But the problem is the people didn't see him as the Messiah king. They saw him as a physical king. In other words, the people said in their hearts and their minds and in their talking that this is the man, this is the one that is going to raise us up to defeat Rome. This is the man we will make king and then he will lead us to conquer Rome and free us. You see, that's the king they were looking for. That's the man they were looking for. They did not view Jesus as the Messiah. And see, it was such a stipulation that what they expected Jesus to do, and then toward the end of the week, he didn't do it. See how easy it was for them to turn on him and to say, crucify him. Crucify him. You see, the crowds actually had hearts of stone. They only honored Jesus that day as the one that they wanted to fulfill their desires. They didn't come to honor him. They came to see that he would do what they wanted. And we discovered that the crowd had no love for Jesus. They had no heartfelt commitment for Jesus. It was all about themselves. And thus, they had hearts of stone. They didn't know who he was. They were self-serving people. Religious people, but self-serving. Now there's another incident in the Bible that we're going to examine, and we need to explain this just a little bit. We find the incident, or similar instances, in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke's gospel tells a story of this early in Jesus' ministry. Matthew, Mark, and John place this next story right around the week of Passion, from about the time that Jesus entered into Jerusalem to the, about the time that he was betrayed. And so we have two distinct timetables, but we also have variations to the story. All four stories vary a little bit on whose house Jesus was at and some of the things that happened, but the, the gist of the story, the summary of the story is all the same. We have a repentant sinner coming to Jesus and 
the rest of the people in the house rejecting the actions of that person. So, we don't know if these are just two stories or maybe three or four stories, but it's similar. And we can understand here in our culture, if somebody does something and then it's on the news or word gets around, other people think, well, that's a good idea. I think I'll do that too. So you see, it's possible that this did happen more than two times, three or four times, or it's possible that it was two major incidences. But our focus this morning is on the hearts of the people and in comparison to the hearts of those that lined the road on Jesus' journey into Jerusalem. We're going to choose to go to Luke's Gospel. Now this is the incident that takes place earlier in Jesus' ministry, but it's maybe the most descriptive and views the heart of people the most, and then we'll still compare with the incident that happened later in his ministry. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 is where we'll start. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who, this, who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, it's likely that at this Pharisee's house, Simon, that there were several guests. Simon invited Jesus, maybe his disciples were not told, but he likely had other Pharisees or other guests there also. But this story is only about three people. Simon, the Pharisee, the religious leader of Israel, the woman who lived a sinful life, and Jesus, the teacher. Now, another way of saying this is, this was Simon, the hard-hearted or the stone-hearted. The woman, the broken-hearted. And Jesus, the healer of hearts. Let's examine the story. Verse 37 tells us what kind of a woman this is, and that she was likely still living a sinful life up to the time when she came in to anoint Jesus. Verse 37 says, A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. See, this doesn't say that she had lived and repented. This describes this incident that this woman, up to the point of coming to Jesus, had still been living a sinful life. What kind of a life? She was probably a prostitute and held very, very low in the eyes of the religious community. The kind of person that Simon would not want touching him and would not expect that any religious person would allow to, that she would touch them. I go back to when I was in elementary school. I had three older brothers, no sisters, so there was four of us boys in the family. And so I kind of maybe had a corrupted view of girls because when I was little and in school, we played a game called cooties. Now, maybe you've done it. Maybe this isn't acceptable anymore. Probably isn't as I look back on it. But we boys would get to school or at recess and it was kind of a corrupted game of tag that we would play. One of us would walk up to one of the girls in the class rub her hand on her shoulder or her back and say, Ooh, I've got cooties. And then we would chase the other boys and this began the corrupted game of tag. Cootie tag, you might call it. As I look back at this, I see how bad of an instant that was. And yes, we did get in trouble for it at one point. We got called down by the teacher. 
But when we look at Simon, and he says, don't touch her, don't let her touch you. Isn't this very much like we Christians? That we agree that the world needs to be saved for Jesus, but we also think that we, we need to lift them up to our lifestyle. They need a take baths and showers daily. They need to dress appropriately. They need to have a certain social status. And see, many times we as Christians view sinners as down and out and they need saved. We need to tell them about Jesus. We need to feed the poor. We need to clothe those. But we don't want to touch them. We don't want to get near them. Now, now this is not the attitude of all Christians, but it is of many. That they're untouchables. Win them to Christ, but let's not get too close. So let's not be too hard on Simon because some of us are like Simon. But you see, Simon had this hard heart, this heart of stone. Even though he was a religious leader and should have known better, he didn't treat this woman as he should. And so we see that Simon and the people that lined the road of Jesus going into Jerusalem of the triumphant entry, uh, all stone-hearted. In their own little ways, religious people, expectations out of Jesus that wasn't coming about. When we look at a similar incident of a woman anointing Jesus in Mark's gospel, we see something else interesting. Mark writes and tells us that the woman anointed Jesus, I think it was Jesus' head at that point with this perfume, and the disciples of Jesus and others in the room proclaimed, wow, this is, this is a waste of money. That should have been sold and given to the poor. But Jesus rebuked them. He said, no, she, this thing is beautiful. She anointed me for my burial. See, Jesus knew what was coming, and they didn't. Now, that's not saying the disciples understood or agreed because what happened next is really, really interesting in Mark's gospel. After this incident happened, Mark writes, Then Judas went to Israel's religious leaders and betrayed Jesus, agreed to betray Jesus. Judas also had this heart of stone was hard-hearted. So when we, when we look at the people in our stories here, we see the people that lined the road going into Jerusalem were hard-hearted. They, they wanted what they wanted out of Jesus. And when they didn't get out of Jesus what they wanted, they yelled, crucify him later in the week. Simon the Pharisee should have known better, but yet he also was stone-hearted and hard-hearted, thinking, don't let that woman touch you, Jesus. And Simon certainly wouldn't have let her touch him. And then we have Judas, also hard-hearted, a heart of stone. When he didn't get his way, when Jesus wasn't what he expected, he too took matters into his own hands and he wanted to bring about whatever it was in betraying Jesus, whatever his purpose was. Who knows what it was? Hard-hearted people led to their demise. So what about the woman? I mean, this is where we need to come to, but we had to set these scenes up. What about this woman? Was she brave in walking into this Pharisee's house to cry over Jesus' feet and to dry his feet then with her hair and, and then to kiss his feet and then to pour this perfume on them? Was he brave or was she broken? See, I think she was broken. I think this woman's spirit was broken and she came in deep humility to worship and honor Jesus. She was broken because of her lifestyle. Now we don't know at what point she started becoming repentant, but it was climaxed at that point when she walked into, G into the house of the Pharisee and broke down and anointed Jesus. So at some point, she realized that this was the one that she needed to worship, that this was the Messiah, this was the Lord, Jesus is the one. 
And so she came to him. So can you understand her brokenheartedness? But what was the cost of her worship? What was the cost of her worship? That's what we're going for today. And we're going to let the psalmist tell us. We go back to Psalm 51. King David wrote this psalm. And if you remember, King David, later in his career, got lazy. He stayed home from the battle. In the springtime, nations go out to battle. And David should have been leading his army, but no, he stayed home. And one time he was up on his palace looking down and he saw a woman taking a bath and he lusted after her. He told his servants, bring her to me. And he had an adulterous affair with her. Later found out that she was pregnant. And then to cover things up, she, he eventually had her husband killed on the battlefield. So that's murder. So David was now an adulteress and a murderer. And he thought he got away with it. He could marry Bathsheba and everything's going to be fine until the prophet Nathan came to him and said, David, you are guilty of sin. You are an adulterer. You are a murderer. And David took this to heart. At that point, he knew he had made the most drastic of all mistakes. And you know how it is. We can sometimes get wrapped up in sin and not realize the full uh, impact of what we're doing and, and at that point David was broken hearted and he wrote Psalm 51 we're not going to read the whole psalm but we're going to read verses 16 and 17 what is the cost of worship keep that in mind David writes to God you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings my sacrifice O God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. So what is the cost of our worship? The cost of worship is a broken and contrite heart. The cost of worship is a broken and contrite heart, a, a heart that's repentant, a heart that's remorseful. You see, the story about the woman with this alabaster jar of perfume is not about her perfume. It's not about that she poured this on Jesus' feet. The story of the sinful woman is that she was brokenhearted. She broken spirit. She was contrite. She was, she was repentant, remorseful. Her heart was bruised, it was worn, it was exhausted from her life of sin. And so she turned to Jesus in, in some of the most humble worship ever seen. She went to Jesus and she wet his feet with her tears and dried his feet with her hair, kissed his feet and then poured this expensive perfume. Probably the only thing in life that she had of any value. Once she was totally broken, then she gave this physical sacrifice to Jesus to anoint him with his perfume. She poured out that bottle on his feet. Now, just imagine this. You ladies that have perfume, and you know how strong it is and how just a little bit goes a long way. And you guys understand this too. You get close to your, to your wife, your sweetheart, and, and, and she smells beautiful with this scent of perfume. But have you ever spilled at that bottle or have gotten too much on? It's almost repulsive because it's so strong. Now imagine this woman, this really expensive perfume that's her trademark in her profession. She took what was used for sin and turned it around and used it for worshiping to anoint Jesus. And she poured it out on his feet. And I don't know if she rubbed it in with her hands or with her hair. But can you imagine the aroma that filled the room? It would have been so strong and almost overwhelming, but it was meant for worship. So it was a, it was a sweet savor to Jesus. Was it a waste? No, Jesus loved what she did. Was it terrible that her, a sinner, knelt at the feet of Jesus and touched him and kissed him? No, 
She was kneeling at the feet of God. It was the mark of a broken and repentant heart. And see, that is the mark of a winner in the eyes of God. We talked about Secretariat as a, as a racehorse, a, a, a winner because of his large heart. Now, I think it took more than just a large heart, though, and we might call it the heart of Secretariat. The, the, uh, we're, we're just going to use this for analogy. The, the spiritual heart, the, the heart that wasn't physical, his will to win, we'll, we'll say that way. His heart of will to win was, was deep within Secretary. He'd been trained, he'd been bred for this. And so when we look at our hearts, they're again not our physical heart, but our, our spiritual heart. Our will to serve Jesus. We were created to worship, to worship God. We were created to bow down before him. And so therefore, it is the heart of our worship that is so powerful and that we come repentant. It's our spiritual heart, our broken heart, our humble heart, our broken spirit that makes us winners in the eyes of Jesus. It is said that those who have lived the worst lives, the, the most sinful lives in their ignorance, or those who have gone through the worst tragedies, when those people come to Jesus, it is said that they truly understand what it's like to take their alabaster jar of perfume and pour on the feet of the Master. Because those people, once they are truly repentant and see how deep in sin that they were, and they know the refreshingness of coming to the Master, but how broken they are and the tears and how difficult it is. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem. And it appeared that this was going to be a, a jubilant celebration and a week of, of really, really praising God. But we find out that those people expected things of Jesus that he was not there for. They did not worship him as the Messiah. They worshiped him as the king that would conquer Rome. And when Jesus didn't do it, those hard-hearted people, those people with hearts of stone, crucified him. We see that Simon the Pharisee had a similar heart. A religious man, a deeply religious man, but yet he had expectations of what life was like as a religious person. Don't let the sinners touch you. Jesus set the different example. Jesus demonstrated that we are to love those who are brokenhearted. We are to love even our enemies. We see that Judas Iscariot was stone-hearted also, hard-hearted. He wanted his way, whatever that was, whatever his intentions were of betraying Jesus, Jesus was not evidently doing what Judas wanted and therefore Judas acted on his own and eventually cost him his life. But this woman, this woman, the, this sinful woman who had lived this terrible life came to Jesus broken-hearted. and repented of those sins. See, a broken heart produces the kind of person that commits to following Jesus. A broken heart commits to doing whatever he says and going wherever he sends. That's the cost of worship, is this broken and repentant heart, this contrite heart, to give to Jesus. Do we have to keep giving to Jesus? Of course. See, the question is, what do we come to worship for? What do we come to church for? Do we come to worship Jesus to see what we can get out of it? Do we come to say, well, that was a good song service, or that wasn't a very good song service. I didn't like the songs today. The congregation didn't sing right, or the, the, the sermon just didn't hit the mark today. It wasn't very good. I didn't like Sunday school class. Did you hear what such and such said? See, that's coming to worship and saying, well, what can I get out of it? And that's not what Jesus asks of us. 
Jesus wants us to come to worship and say, what can we give to you, Jesus? How can we honor your Father, Jesus? And when we come to worship to give, when worship costs us something, then many times God blesses us back. And that's how we receive from worship, after we have truly, in broken spirit, given to Him. See, this is what the communion service is all about. We come to remember what Jesus gave for us, and we come as broken people, as a broken sinner, to bow down before our King and say, I am so sorry for the sins. And so, just because you're a Christian, don't think that's a one and done type of thing, because it isn't. We continue to sin. Now, yes, we mature as we age in our, in our maturity, I should say, as Christians. And hopefully we're doing less and less sins, but there's always sin in our life that we need to come to Jesus in a broken spirit over that sin and say, I lay it out before you and I'm so sorry. So the question this morning is, what does worship cost you? What's in your alabaster jar? What's the cost of your worship? And you see, when we realize that, and when we give that to Jesus, it truly does give us a better life. A life that's free from our sins, or freer from our sins, because we're still going to sin in this life. But it lightens our burden. It lightens what we're carrying. And see, if we, if we worship like this, we will truly have the best life ever. It may not be riches that are physical, but our riches are spiritual, and our treasure is laid up in heaven. Almighty Father in heaven, we come to you and we, we ask of your forgiveness, but we come in brokenheartedness, we come with a contrite heart, a broken spirit, Father, to say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for what I've done in the past. I'm so sorry for what uh, things I, I, I'm sinning against you and against my brothers and sisters, against even my enemies, my attitudes, what I say, what I allow my heart and mind to dwell on. Father, we ask your forgiveness as we come broken. And we pray, Father, that we learn from the crowds that lined the road of Jesus' journey into Jerusalem, that we learn from Simon the Pharisee, that we learn from Judas, and most of all, that we learn from this sinful, sinful woman that repented of her sins and came to worship and anoint Jesus. Help us to be like that woman, Father, with that spirit that we truly worship you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website, rosscupchurch.org, and that's spelled R O U S culpchurch.org. You can find information there on how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you or talk with you and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.